There is a huge misconception out there when it comes to how much it actually costs to build out your very own home lab. In this video, not only am I gonna show you that it is very affordable, but it is actually very easy to spin up just a little Linux server, install a really nice dashboard to manage various applications, and really give yourself the opportunity to dive into the potential of what just having a little home lab server can do for you. Now, actually setting up a home lab and running multiple services, you really don't need that powerful of a machine at all. I have videos using old laptops as home labs, and those have their own really great use cases, considered the built-in UPC keyboard screen and all that. You could use a single board computer like a Zima board or even a Raspberry Pi or my personal favorite mini PCs. Now the misconception may be partially my fault because a lot of the mini PCs that I've been covering as of recent have been rather expensive. I've looked at some of the Intel Nooks which have a hefty price tag and even some of the higher end AMD machines. Now that's where this video is going to be a little different. Here we have the Geekom Mini Air 11. This is an incredibly affordable mini PC. This right here is the Geekom website. This is the mini PC that we're gonna be taking a look at. And you can see it is $120, an incredible value. They did sponsor this video and send this over to kind of do this demo and show you how affordable this can be. Of course, you don't need to use their specific mini PCs. And there are other affordable options. This is an Intel Celeron based system. The uh, Zima board, like I mentioned earlier, is another Intel Celeron based. But one of the reasons why I really like these mini PCs is because one, the RAM is upgradable, and in many cases, the SSD is upgradable, which is something I've already done. This is the little NVMe SSD that came with this device. It is a 256 gig for me. I need a little bit more in my home lab. I would say the minimum you're going to want is probably a terabyte, if not two. Now this does not have the option for a 2.5 inch hard drive, which then that can really increase your storage potential. For that, we'd want to go with something a little thicker like this uh, IT12 here. But for budget systems and just getting started, this right here will work awesome. And if you're going something budget like this, these little Intel machines are awesome because hardware transcoding on Intel CPUs generally is a pretty good deal. If you don't know, hardware transcoding is actually like converting media on the fly, such as downscaling something from 4K to 1080p and Plex or Jellyfin while you're on like your mobile phone, for example. Now, just a quick hardware overview here. This specifically is an Intel Celeron N5095 featuring four core, four threads. This thing is really light, comes in just over a pound. It does have Windows 11 pre-installed on the SSD that I've taken out of it. I put a terabyte in here that we're gonna be installing Ubuntu server onto. This does have dual channel DDR4 memory. It ships with one stick, one eight gigabyte stick. So if you do want that dual channel speed, you may need to uh, pick up another stick. This thing is listed to support up to the one terabyte that I put in here. Looking at some of the IO here, we do have a USB-C. These are data only, so they cannot use, or you cannot use these for display. On the front here, we have a single USB 3.2 Gen 2. We have our auxiliary, our power button. We have some airflow on the sides, a Kingston lock. On this side, we have an SD card slot. On the back, we have our 19 volt power in a mini display port. We have a gigabit ethernet, two USB 3.2 Gen 1 port, another USB-C for data transfer, and then an HDMI. This is kind of the minimum setup you're going to want. You don't really need the mini display. As long as you have one HDMI, you're gonna be good to go. And of course, breaking into these little mini PCs and actually upgrading them is really easy. You just unscrew these three screws here, which also double as the kind of uh, feet pads. Unscrew those, pop it off, you have access to everything you're going to want access to. So that is the device. Again, they did sponsor this video, so if you're interested in picking it up, there will be a link down below. So what we need to do now is install Ubuntu server onto it. Now for this, it's a pretty simple process, so I'm not gonna do a full step-by-step -step guide on the Ubuntu server installation. It's really easy. You get a USB stick similar to this one. You're gonna to want to plug it into your machine. I will note it's gonna wipe everything on it, so do make sure you actually back up that USB. If you would like to, this is the official kind of wiki for Casa OS, which we're gonna be using a little bit later. They support Debian and Ubuntu server, as well as Raspberry Pi OS, if that's something you're gonna to want to be using. So from there, you're gonna to want to use a tool such as Etcher to actually flash the ISO file that you're gonna to download to the USB. You're gonna to wanna to plug it in, go into your BIOS or your boot menu. I believe on this one, it's either delete or escape. It will vary depending on the device you want to use and actually boot to the um, 
USB that you just flashed. You may need to disable secure boot depending if you get a weird like UFI error, that's something you're gonna to want to do. And then once you're in, it's as simple as kind of following the prompts. You select your keyboard, your language, all that kind of stuff. Make sure you select the proper hard drive. You're gonna to want to search for third-party drivers just in case. I'll leave a link down below to a full kind of walkthrough of the Ubuntu server setup, but it's pretty straightforward. The one thing you are going to want to do for sure is one, make sure that if you are installing this, you back up anything that's on your hard drive because we are going to wipe it. Select the appropriate disk. Within the installation, it's going to give you what your IP address is going to be. I highly recommend actually plugging this into Ethernet because using Wi-Fi and trying to set that up is one, an absolute pain, and two, Ethernet is just going to be much more reliable. So do take note of that IP address, it's going to kind of spit up at you. You're going to be using that later to connect in the terminal and actually install Casa OS. Do make sure you select to install the open SSH server, you're going to want that. You don't need to install any of the snap packages that kind of pop up, we could do all that kind of stuff later. And run the install, let it update reboot and if all is well you should get a login prompt if you did forget to that ip address you could obviously do ipa so from there let's go into uh, screen recording and do the actual installation of casa os it's made by the same people who make the zima board which is a wonderful little single board computer i generally kind of prefer the little mini pcs that we're working with here because uh, we have options to upgrade the storage, RAM, things like that. The Zimbo board doesn't have that. Granted, it does have that mini uh, PCIe functionality, which is super cool. And just Casa OS has a lot of options to make everything really easy to set up. Down here, we can see some of the apps or Docker containers I have available. A good amount to start out with. And what we are going to do is simply scroll all the way back up here and we're going to copy this curl command. So let's give that a copy. There we go. This is going to install both Casa OS and all the various prerequisites. But now what we're going to do, since we installed OpenSSH when we installed Ubuntu server, we are going to connect to it. So for this, we are going to open up a terminal here and we're going to SSH into it. So SSH, your username, at the IP address. I think it's 152. Uh, I'll be back. There we go. It was 53. I didn't properly... Uh, restarted after the initial installation. So now we are in the Geekom 11 Air. Now we do have some updates here, so generally before anything, it's always good to update our Ubuntu server. So we're gonna do a sudo apt update, type in our password, let it refresh those repositories and pull the potential updates. There we go, now we'll do a sudo apt upgrade. Let's go ahead and restart all the services and okay. There we go, so now we're up to date. So all we need to do to install this is paste in that curl command that we copied earlier, hit enter, and now we have CasOS made by Ice Whale. So they're installing all the necessary dependencies and we can kind of monitor and see exactly what is going on here. So we have net tools being installed and there's a big list of everything that it's grabbing. So we have a uh, various Python packages, just a whole bunch of dependencies overall. You can see it unpacking it, grabbing all of those. It even says, please, please ignore the following error. Installed all the necessary dependencies. You can see it's grabbing SMB clients so we can log into it really easily. Installing various dependencies as unzipped Docker. So all the applications and everything that we're about to dive into are all Docker based. And you could probably even install something like Protainer with this and have it kind of work together in that regard. So this is installing the Icewell Casa OS releases. And we just keep scrolling down. And here's where we are. So. It's successfully installed, it's starting all the services right now, and boom, there we go. So easy as that, our CAS OS is 0.4 so on, and it's running right here. So if I go ahead and copy this, open up our web browser, paste it in, hit enter, you can see it's going to take us to the CAS OS page. So I'm gonna go ahead and full screen this real quick, let's zoom in, and then we just need to click on go. It's gonna ask us to set up our account. I'm just gonna kind of match it with our server. There we go, great. And here we go, I'm gonna accept the news feed from the blog. And here's our server, and this is a really beautiful dashboard. We have our system statistics, it's only using 1% of the CPU. We have our power usage, our RAM, so we only have eight gigs in, but it's really not using that much. Here we have our storage, which it looks like it's not using the full terabyte. So if I go over here, ooh, they have a uh, merge storages. They have a couple different new things here that I didn't notice last time. Here's the full storage right there, so I probably need a little bit of a tweaking to get that to uh, work properly. There's our full drive and we can see uh, statistics such as our temperature and all that. If I go back over to storage, you can create storage here, so if you want to plug in external drives, you can um, 
mount that through here. Got some network statistics, not really doing too much at the moment. We have the option to sync our data, smarten up our home. We can add things here and we have our applications and we can drag these icons around. The default application installed is files. So if I were to open this, it gives us a really nice overview of our uh, various system files. And let's just say I go to media, for example, I wanted to create a new folder. I could call this something like tech hut. And let's say I wanted to mark this as shared, submit that, go in here. There's not really much going on. Then let's go down here to shared, for example, and go to tech hut, click on the little menu, get network path. You can see the options here. If I wanted to give this a copy, for example, go in here, it's not showing up by default fault in my shared network, but if I did paste this in, hit enter, there we go. And I should be able to go and grab something here like a past project, copy that, paste it in, and there we go. Now the network transfer speed here is kind of slow. That's because I'm on a Wi-Fi network on this computer from further away. But if I jump back in here, we can see that it's actually working. So if I go back over to media, go into Tech Hut, you can see this is a micro Weber one click video and we have something in there already. So just a really cool default application there. Now, if you're gonna be setting up a home lab, you're gonna want more services than a simple kind of file sharing thing. So that's where their app store comes in. And again, these are just various Docker containers that are kind of pre-configured to be able to easily install through this system. Jellyfin right here is really good if you wanna spin up your own media server. I'm not gonna talk about the R applications too much. I have to kind of tiptoe around that but I do love them. <laughs> Let's say theoretically, one of my favorite use cases for actually having a uh, home lab server is something like Photo Backup, your very own self-hosted kind of Google Photos alternative. So if I go ahead and grab this, so if I install Photo Prism here, default account is admin Casa OS, and obviously we could change these. Let's go next steps, and it's gonna go ahead and start that installation for us. Now, while it does that, I'm on my phone here. I opened up an application called PhotoSync. I'm gonna go ahead and continue. It allows us to select, send, receive, continue. This is the application that PhotoPrism recommends for backup. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get out of here. We're gonna to go to settings and go under configure and we can see PhotoPrism right there. We'll do the trial. I'm just trying to show a demo here. PhotoPrism one, edit account. I'm connected to my local network, so I'm just gonna do it that way. So 168.1.15. Three, admin, password is Casa OS, and all looks good. So I'm gonna connect that, see if it works, and there we go, perfect. So now I'm gonna just go done, and I'm gonna click this little sync button, and I'm just gonna go send. Let's send them all, and send it through PhotoPrism. Let's just send it into the root, and there we go. So now, if I go over here to PhotoPrism, we can see here it's gonna open up in the proper port in its own application, own little website kind of deal here. PhotoPrism is loading. We're gonna log in with that default information it gave us, name of the admin and Casa OS. We can see there's nothing found yet, but if we go over to library, we are going to do a rescan. So let's start that. It's gonna go check all of our files and see if we have anything in there. What you can see, it's indexing Google Pixel 6 camera, so it's uploading in the uh, same kind of directories that I'm using on my phone. And we can see numbers start filling out here. So we have videos, places, labels, and a lot more. If I just go back to the home page for now, we can see some things starting to show up. For example, this picture right here, I just recently took and posted. It's a little uh, YOLO box right there. But that's just one quick example, real rough install. I'd wanna go through and actually configure it, set up SSL certificates and all that. But this is just one example of something that you can do with uh, having your own little cheap home lab. So now if we go back to AppStar, you could do things like Home Assistant, AppGuard, Calibre Web. We do truly have a bunch of different stuff here ready to go for us to install and play around with, including torrent clients, Protainer, which I talked about earlier. This is honestly is kind of my preferred way to work with Docker. And just if we click install, it will allow us to jump into an instance. And this is a pretty lightweight application, so it should be pretty quick and it's done. So if we click on Protainer, here we are, we have our new user set up and you'd wanna go through, set up a strong, complicated and secure password, create user. From home, we have our local environment. So I'm gonna live connect to it real fast. There we go. And if we go over to containers, we can see we have PhotoPrism and Protainer. 
So if you want a more nitty gritty kind of hands-on approach to actually managing Docker, this is one of the applications easily built into that. Kind of like I said earlier, how you could have them kind of work together. Considering the fact it's actually in here, it's very, very possible. If I click the little plus here, we can install a customized app or external link here. So in a way it kind of can act as your dashboard, something like Homar or Heimdall, it can act as that. So like a customized app, for example, if you did install something through Protainer and it's not showing up here, this is where you'd want to go ahead and add that. You can add icons, the actual UI, ports, volumes, variables, etc. Really cool stuff. And of course, if we dive over here, we could jump into a terminal. So for that, we're gonna copy this, connect, and then here we are in our Ubuntu terminal. So you don't even really need to SSH into it like we did to install it. You can access the terminal directly through the uh, Casa OS dashboard. So now it's really at this point, you have the framework and foundation to begin playing around, testing out Docker containers, really start experimenting with what home labs can do for you. And you, it's super cheap. The device that we're demoing this on comes in under $200. You get a Zima board, which Casa OS ships on for stock for about the same price. But again, for getting started, the mini PCs are awesome because you can actually upgrade the RAM. You can throw in like a two terabyte SSD without having to have a thing stuck to the side of it. Really cool stuff. So with all that, big thank you again for Geekum for sending over that little uh, Mini Air 11 for us to check out. If you are interested in purchasing it, there'll be a link down below. They, have, of course, have other models, so you could get something a little bit more beefier. If you want some stronger, like, hardware transcoding for media, they have AMD machines. I'll leave some links down below. And with all that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day, and goodbye.